you again this morning. I, I appreciate that. I know several, the, I look around the room and I'm, I count all the missing faces, you know, people traveling and out and about and so forth. So uh, Romans, or, I'm sorry, Genesis 8, if you will, this morning, uh, we're going to just, we've been looking at stuff and I thought we would just do a little off the cuff study this morning. I entitled this, Remember the Eights. And it's a fascinating thing when you come to the Word of God and uh, the eights that are, uh, that are there. I, I have told you, you ought to spend some time and look at all of the three sixteens in the Bible. And then go look at the 1313. Uh, 13 in the number of Bible is wickedness. It's the Gentile number. And uh, you all know John 3.16, but go look at them. It's interesting how, how they work out the theme that's in them. Uh, eight in your scripture is a verse of new beginning. It's a, it's a number of new beginnings. And it's very interesting when you look at the eights in scripture. And we're not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm headed to Romans 8. That's where we're headed, okay? So we're going to do some things quickly to get to Romans 8. Because that's really where our eights are. You know, remember our eights. But just in thinking about the, that issue of eight, many of you are aware, obviously, of the, the, the tremendous storm that just came through and is wreaking havoc all over the southeast and uh, so forth. And, and you think about those. But can you imagine leaving, coming back, and everything you know is completely gone? It's just destroyed. It's, it's devastated. You know, you think about the stuff there in Tennessee, the parks and everything that were there, millions of people visit, and they're gone. They're not there anymore. You know, Chimney Rock and all those different places, and just boom. And then you begin to think, then we'll come a little closer, and what did we have? 117 yesterday, you know, <laughs> enough. And, the, and then the AC goes out. So now what do you do? Well, you go to the movie. <laughs> go to the beach. Or you go to, to, uh, to the mall or walk around. But the, my point is, is things happen in life. And when that comes and that happens like that, then honestly, you need to remember your eight, Romans 8. We'll get over there to that. But just look at Genesis 8 here. Uh, Genesis 8, by the way, seven. if you look at the end of Genesis there, chapter 7, verse 24, And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters a sage. They didn't go quickly, okay? When the flood receded and the waters receded, it didn't go fast. It took time. It took, a, it, it, it took them 150 days at least. But if you look at verse 8, again, remember your age, Genesis 8. Also he, and that's going to be Noah, sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her feet, and she returned unto him into the ark, and for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into the, unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. Noah sends the dove out, comes back, nothing. He waits seven days. Seven, the number of, of, uh, of, of perfection, creation number. And then on the eighth day, what did it Noah do? Sent her out again. She comes back with the olive leaf. What did that signal? New beginning. It's a, new it's a new opportunity, a newness. If you drop down to verse 18, And Noah went forth and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. That's interesting because you, you come, come over to 2 Peter 2. I, I, I wrote these down for you in your handout there just so you would have them. 2 Peter 2 verse 5, And spared not the old world but saved Noah, the eighth person. Isn't that interesting? He's the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, being in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He's the eighth. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, verse twenty. 
which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. How long did it take God? How long was that long suffering? Do you remember? 120 years. That's a long time to be long suffering. I mean, you think about that. The ark was preparing within few, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. I just want you to catch the eights. See that eight, new beginning, a new horizon, a new thing going to happen, a new world, actually. You know, they, he, Peter will later, well, you're there, 2 Peter 3. Look, look, look over there at that. It's just interesting. 2 Peter 3. I, I tell you, the study of God's word ought to consume your time instead of social media and all the other nonsense that's out there. And I know you got to know what's going on. But I tell you what, when you go outside and it's hot, you know it's hot. You don't need the weatherman to tell you that, okay? If you look at 2 Peter 3, he says there, verse, five, verse 4, talking about the scoffers, the last day scoffers, wherein is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that they then was, being overflowed with water. What? You see, man doesn't have any idea of what God's word says about the world. See, they think the flood didn't happen. They think this earth has been the same since the beginning. What ha- the flood changed things, messed it all up, crushed Uh, smashed his decreed place, Psalms talks about. Now, come back to Genesis 17. I just really, just catch the eights. It's just fascinating. Genesis 17, verse number 12, talking about the Abrahamic covenant. Second, I'm sorry, Genesis 17, 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in his generation. Think about that, eight days why? We got a beginning of a new life. We got a beginning of a new manhood because we got a new kid on the block, if you will. It's, by the way, it's very fascinating. Come back to Romans now. That David, you remember what happened with David and Bathsheba and the firstborn to Bathsheba? He died. Do you remember how old he was? Seven days. He didn't make circumcision. That's fascinating. Sorry. To me, it's fascinating, Okay. Look at Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter, well, what did I say? Yeah, chapter 4. You, you, got, you think about our, our eights. Spend the rest of the morning looking at our eights. Paul, Romans 8, we're alive unto God. We're dead to the flesh. We have the power of the Holy Spirit's ministry working in our inner man through his word. 1 Corinthians 8. We get this great section, we just started it this morning in the first hour, 9.30 hour, of, of, of about our liberty and the proper use of it, the understanding of the principle of it, chapter 9, the practice of it, how it's going to look, Chap, uh, chapter uh, t- uh, 10 there, how he's going to get in. He uses, I'm sorry, principle picture of it, that's chapter 9, principle or practice of it is chapter 10, this right use of our liberty in regards to, to the saints, to the other members of the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians 8, oh, you got to love 2 Corinthians 8. You know why? It's all about the collection. It's all about collecting the offering for the poor saints at Jerusalem and how to get that done and how to, to, to work that through. Romans chapter 4 and verse 8. Romans 4 and verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Boy, isn't that wonderful? That is so just, man, look, and, and it's an 8 verse. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a wonderful verse. Romans 5 and verse 8. But God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for it. Man, what a ver- that's a great verse. 4 8, 5 8. By the way, I know what's going to happen. What about 1-8? Well, 1-8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. There's that testimony of faith. See? What about 2-8? Well, look over there at 2-8. But unto him that, that are con- contentious and do not obey the truth, 
but, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. 1.8, here's your faith. You, if you're not a believer, you're an unbeliever, you get wrath. So where do you want to be? I want to be a believer. Thank you. 3 verse 8, and not rather as we be slanderously reported and, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. You preach the the gospel of the grace of God. You preach Paul's gospel. You know what they're going to say? You're just telling people they can go live and sin any way they want to and no consequence. And you know what he says in Romans 6? God forbid. So you come over to Romans 6 and verse 8. You see the 8s, they just start rolling. And, you know, before you know it, now you're going to go 8, 18, you know. And what happened in Genesis 8, 8? He sent at that eighth day, the dove goes out, gets in. What happened in 18. The door opened and Moses and, or Moses, Noah and his family leave. They get off the boat. It's over. New earth, new world. Romans 6 and verse number 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Boy, look at that identity that we have. See, we got such great things in the eights. Remember your eights. Things get tough. Life gets tough, you know. We get a, Linda gets a couple texts this morning. Kids are sick. We're not going to be there and so forth. Hey, that, I, I know what it's like raising wildlife. You, it's, it's tough. You know, one goes down, the next one gets it, and the next one after that, and the next thing you know, you don't know if it's Monday, Tuesday, or eight, you know, what it is. Linda and I, we've been cleaning out the garage <coughs> so I can move another household in, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, at one time, I had four houses in my garage. I don't know how it worked, but we got her. But the thing is, is you get to looking at pictures. Linda's been doing ancestry work for like five, for our families, the, the family tree. You know what you do to family trees, don't you? You burn them down. You start finding out some stuff. It's like, whoa, let's burn that thing down, you know, cut that off, you know. But the thing is, is, and by the way, you find out some pretty wonderful stuff too. My forefathers on the Jordan side, helped settle Jamestown in that area in Virginia. And I actually have a plaque with my name on it. <laughs> now, it's his name, but, you know, my, it's my namesake. Anyway, it's, you, know, you learn some things. That has nothing to do with the eights. But the thing is, is, but it's life. Exactly. Thank you. You know, you go, you do, you trouble through, and it's like, oh, my goodness, I, what's going to happen here? Well, if you start remembering your eights, come, come over with me. And just think about, look at Ephesians, uh, chapter 1. Ephesians, chapter 1. And look at verse 8. Ephesians 1, 8. Wherein he, God the Father, hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Isn't that wonderful? He says, I want you to be able to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. I want you to know the love of Christ that passes all understanding. I want you to have that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make it known to you. And I'm going to use the Apostle Paul. We're going to write some books. We're going to put it in the Bible. We're going to preserve it. And you got it. And now you can do what? Now you can live life. How about Ephesians 2, verse 8? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Boy, isn't that a liberating verse. The fact that you couldn't do it, he did it. You just got to trust him, and that's enough. By the way, if you look at verse 18, 218, I didn't read 118, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope. I'm in Ephesians 118, sorry. The hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory. You see that thing about enlighten and knowing? What did he do in verse 8? He made known unto you all wisdom and prudence. 2, 8, 2, 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. How did I get there? How do I have access? Well, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The moment you trusted Christ, he gave you the keys to the front door. You just got to go in. I got to figure out how to use the key. Rightly dividing the word, that's the key to understanding the Bible. Open that door, go walking right in it. You, the Father invites that relationship, 2 Corinthians 6, of a father-son-daughter relationship, a father with my son and my daughter, that intimate family relationship. I want to have that with you, and I've given you access into me by who you are in my son. 
not because you're such a great catch. Glad to have you, but you're really not so cool. But in Christ, you're mine. And there's an inheritance in that. Come over to chapter uh, 3 of Ephesians. Yes, I'm trying to stay in a book, okay? Not just like it's way over here. You ever have one of those moments when you're going down the road and all of a sudden it's like, oh, look, a squirrel. <laughs> okay, that's what's going through my mind right now. Look at Ephesians 3.18. And be, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. Do you imagine, can you imagine the God of the universe says, I want you to know everything. And I made it known to you in my book. And I want you to know everything. So that when life tops and turves on you, you can have comfort. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, with these words, comfort one another. Come, fort, fortify. Come and fortify the inner man. In that great chapter, about where Paul addresses the issue of losing a loved one who's in Christ and the fact that there will be one day a great reunion in the sky. And when, you ha when that happens and that great reunion, that's comfort. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Man, what greatness. What a great thing. And it all comes. Come back to 1 Corinthians 1. It all comes because of who we are in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Wow. What great comfort there is. What great power we have. Now come over to Romans 8. We have this, we spent time looking at our Ebenezer. I talked with some folks this week and they said, I never knew we had such an Ebenezer, that stone of help. By the way, Ebenezer, we usually think of Scrooge, McDuck and all that stuff. And you didn't catch that, did you? Maybe some of you did, old enough to understand. But Ebenezer, the, the rock of help. And we have this idea, we have this understanding, we have this I identity this Ebenezer, this help of who we are in Christ. And we looked at chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 with that issue of understanding our identity. Why? I want you to comprehend. I want you to know. I want you to be on solid ground. I don't want you tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. I want you to be able to look at things and, and digest them and, and think through them and say, that doesn't match the verse, and that does. Because by faith you stand. Don't stand on that, my verse, 2 Corinthians 1 there, 24, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand, 1 Corinthians 1, 24. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 1, 24. The thing is, is man, you're going to stand having, all, having done all to stand, Ephesians 6, the armor issue. So in Romans 8, he lays out some things here about when trouble comes and when things kind of get going, remember your eights. <laughs> remember those eights. Romans 8, 8. What a great verse. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We need to remember that. If you operate in your flesh, you'll never please God. Religion tells you different. Religion says get on a treadmill, go to work. Let's go. Win them, wet them, whip them, and work them. No, win them, wet them, work them, and whip them. Get them going. Let's go, let's go, let's go. God's grace says, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Your mind and so You know what you need to do? You need verse 10. And if, you, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of the sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You need to be who you are in Christ. Why? The life is there. You're the life we're to live, your identity, the work of the spirit working in your inner man. That, that thing in verse 14, 15, 16, we spent all that time looking at why? Because where does he work? Ephesians 3, 16, he, works, he strengthens with might. Can you imagine... I hope you don't imagine this. I hope you find this to be real. 
You have the might, the power of God in you. He's in the Holy Spirit. As you take in God's word, rightly divided, put it in that inner man, and the Spirit then accesses that, and then as you go into the details of life, when things seem to be crumbling, you know, you don't bring up the P word. You know what that is, right? Politics. Oh, he, talk, he said P word. Politics. Ah. No, you, I hope you understand we still live in a, the greatest country in the world. As bad as it looks and as bad as we think it is, it's still better than other places. I'm sorry. Okay? So, you oh, don't. Well, what happens if the other side wins from you? You know what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day? You're going to wake up, and whatever happens, happens. You can't, our job isn't to stop that. What is our job? Be that ambassador. Our vocation, go out. Go, can you imagine? Well, anyway, I don't talk, talk. You can't please God operating in the realm of your flesh. Where am I going to please? I'm when I'm operating in who I am in Christ. Now look at verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now that verse right there ought to stop all the angst all the anxieties that we have, all the worry we have, because it's the godly perspective. It's divine viewpoint, verse 18. What is divine viewpoint? The present suffering of this, this, notice that in Israel's program, we don't have the time to run the verses. If Israel was suffering, that means they were not obeying God's word. Because the covenant was, if you hearken, I'll bless you. And if you don't hearken, I'm going to nail you. I'm going to curse you. So when you see famine in Israel, what should that alert you to? They're not obeying God's word. Now, what happens if you don't obey God's word? You don't obey God's word. Why? The present dispensation is a dispensation of what? Suffering. So if you're suffering... It's because we live in this present dispensation. You see the distinction there. You're suffering not because God's trying to get you, trying to educate you, trying to move you. He educates you and gets you through his word. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, you guys know the verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. For what? Reproof, for correction, for instruction. In righteousness, that, the purpose, the intent, why is God working that way? That the man of God may be perfect. Well, what is that? Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He defines it for you. You see, Israel over here, they suffered because they weren't. You and I suffer because we live in, well, there's really three basic issues. The first one, verse 19 for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain until now, and not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Do you know why you suffer? First reason, you live in a sin-cursed creation. That's why. You want to know why bad things happen to good people? It's because we live in a sin-cursed creation. Not God trying to teach and educate. He does that through His Word. That's where He does it from. That's why there is an on. There is an attack against his word. Why do you think they're going to label the Bible hate literature? Because what does the Bible do? The truth shall set you what? Free. Hey, it's liberating to know that the bozos over here don't tell me and the bozos over there don't tell me. God's word's what's edgy. And I'm going to be right here. Thank you very much. And if that means they storm the doors and they throw me, then that's just what it means. You see? That's a divine view. Why? Because the present... The suffering of this present time 
That's the condition. But the verse didn't end there, did it? Oh, by the way, I didn't give you the other two, did I? Go over to Galatians 1. You've got to get the other two. There's three reasons we suffer. One is the sin-cursed creation, Galatians 6. Here's the second one, Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap, shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's the law of the harvest. You make dumb decisions, you're going to reap stupidity. You sow to the flesh, what are you going to get? By the way, what's the law say? You sow over here, you reap much later, don't you? What you sow here, you reap more. So you're going to reap what you sow, you're going to reap more than you sow, and you're going to reap later than you sow. So you may be thinking you're getting away with it, but what does God's Word say? Be sure your sin will find you out. You're going to get nailed. So that's the second reason. One, we live in the sin-cursed creation. Two, you make some pretty bad decisions in life. And you have to, the consequence. The wonderful thing about God and liberty and freedom is he says you're also accountable. And that's why man doesn't like God. Because God holds man accountable. If I'm not accountable, then I'm good to go. That's why professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We figured out a different way to get around the accountability to God. Now, the third one, and this one not everybody sees, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this one to me is the best one. 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 12. I'm sorry these aren't on the overhead, but 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you, as a believer, mature, growing up, you're you're growing, you're learning, and you decide to do do what? Live godly. What's that verse say is coming your way sometime? Persecution. Okay? Now go back to Romans 8. By the way, it says, yea, and all that, I love that, yea, and all that will, that will, an act of your will, willfully choosing to live the way God would have you and I live in the age of grace. But I like that first word. Yay. Yay, I get to suffer. Woohoo! You know, that's not what he's saying, but I just think about it that way. Now go back to Romans 8. On your way, stop at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You got to have a little fun. Thank you. For 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and look, if you will, at verse 13. The suffering. For I reckon that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared. The suffering. Here's God's viewpoint, divine viewpoint. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Notice. Now stop there. Common to man. Isn't that interesting? When life comes up, when, when <laughs> this past week, actually two weeks ago, Linda comes to me. And I'm like, all right, what now? Hit it, give it to me. And she goes, the garbage disposal quit. I go, you know Keith's gone. Why are you telling? <laughs> I'm just, and she goes, no, the garbage. I'm like, really? And she goes, and the dishwasher quit. But if we get a new garbage disposal, maybe the, and I go, no. And then she comes to me and she goes, and the dryer's just stopped. And I'm like, you know what? You're bad news bear. Get out of here. You know? So, but what do you do? Oh, no, God's teaching me. No. The garbage disposal only has a a certain lifespan. We're a few years beyond that lifespan, by the way. Same with the other. Why? Because it's obsolete. Obsolete. um, No. Obsolescence. Anyway, they're designed to break over after time. So guess what I do? I go down over to Home Depot, and I get a new garbage disposal, And I go, I don't need Keith. I can do this myself. And I get down there and I go, maybe I do need Keith. But no, we got it on. It doesn't leak now. It did. It doesn't now. You know, and what what is that? That is common to man. I just pick on Keith because he put it in the first time. Okay? (laughs) It's common. What happened? Not God trying to teach me a lesson of patience with my spouse. 
Other things teach that. <laughs> but it's a look at this going, this is common. Why? Everybody, everybody that's got a garbage disposal breaks. Dishwasher quits, washer dryer stops, house blows up. It's, it's what's next? It's time for a new house, you know. But what happens? Everybody's like, people get this like, religion, legalism, they won't let you off the hook. So they, they what? God's trying to teach you patience. Not really. Now, in the situation, what can I practice? Patience. What can I practice? Romans 5. Tribulation worketh patience, patience experience. And my experience is call Keith. <laughs> Keith was out of town. So I didn't call Keith. I got on, I read the directions, amazing, <laughs> and put it in there. So now have patience worketh experience. Now you know what's going to happen when I call Keith. You can figure it out. You know, hang up, <laughs> okay? But what is 818 telling me? No, man, when I look at trouble... By the way, I didn't finish 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You need to. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. The escaping the issue is the bearing of it. See, he, That verse doesn't say he's going to remove it. Lord, take, take away. No. He says in the moment, in the situation of life, what can you do? You can bear up underneath it. You can get in the word, get the doctrine in you, get what you, that, that whole mindset behind. This isn't compared to the glory that's coming. So what can I do? Then I can work down through this situation. I can come up. He's faithful. He's given me nothing that I can't handle because it's common to man, commonality there. I can then come up. I can get up underneath it, and I can work down through it. And you know what will happen? I'm better for it on the other side. Because now I won't get there again. I'll do this. I'll do something different. Now go back to Romans 8 because time. Romans 8. You see, folks, the issue of, of the eights here isn't to give you an escape clause. It's to give you the comfort and the fortification to go down through the details of life, to look at things and say, I can do that right there easily because God's word says ABC and I can apply ABC to it, whatever it is, because the situations are different, and work through it. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, you can take that a couple ways. There's glory coming in the future, yes, but there's glory now that needs to be put on display in your life. Come down to verse 28, because that's the next day. You see, we're going to suffer but we have to think about suffering the way God, the way the doctrine, the way Christ would have us think about it. And what is it? It's common to man. It's coming my way. And I'm to use that. I'm to take that issue of suffering and I'm to work it out. And I'm to come over here so that there's some glory coming on the other side that's mine in eternity future. But right now, I can put his glory on display in time, in life, right now. So that when people see me go through, they don't go, what? Let's watch him fall off the wagon. He's going to be kooky. He's going to start claiming stuff that isn't right. You know, we, oh, we know. And rather they see you say, you know what? I can work through this. And they see that happen. Now, come up, 828. And we know. <laughs> isn't that interesting? We know. How do we know? The Lord bored a hole in my head and dumped it all in there. How do we know? We know by the ministry and the working of the Holy Spirit in our life, in our inner man, as we study. Verse 26, 27, he's working there. He's those, we take the Word of God into our inner man. We read the chap, three chapters a day. We study. We look at it. We think about things. We say, hey, this is what's happening in life. And Lord, where's the answer? I know the answer's in your Word. We get in. We pull the answer out. Here's the trouble, and we put it together. We know by the ministry, the work of the Holy Spirit in my inner man through His Word working in me. 1 Thessalonians 1, or, uh, chapter 2, that the word of God effectually worketh in you that believe. Believe what? Believe the word of God, and it's going to work in me. 
And when you're doing that, we know something, don't we? We know that all things, all right, well, what's the all things? How about all the stuff since 18, verse 18? All the things of life, the details of life, all the things that are going to come in life, all the things that come up against me. Again, 18 is the context of, of, of Romans 8 here, 28. All, way, all the things of life. I take all the things of life that come and I mix them in with what God's Word says, what His will says. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says that in all things you give thanks. This is the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Not for all things, but what? In all things. You know what that means? You better be in it. Well, he, you can't be in it if he's pulling it out of the way for you. That verse doesn't make sense if he's rescuing you from every little hurt thing. No, in that, in all of that, I can take God's word, what he's doing today in the dispensation of grace, and I can come over there, and then he says, for the good to them, they're going to work together. Notice, for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. It's going to come in there, and it's going to work good doesn't say rescue, doesn't say remove, doesn't say eliminate. It says good. What's good? You guys are looking at me like I'm nuts. Look over at Romans 12. I am, but that's out for debate. What is Romans? Look at Romans 12. It's going to produce good. That's what he's talking about. Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I love that, reasonable. Let's think this through. Let's don't be, you know, naive. Let's be mature. Let's be grown-ups. Let's adult sons. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Good. It's not three steps in the will of God. Good. Do you remember, you remember another time when God said it was good? Creation, Genesis 1. Good in what way? Good in that it matched the pattern. Good in that it has a purpose. It has a design. Acceptable. There's a reason for it. Perfect. Now I understand why it is the way it is, and I can now grow up into it. Perfect. Follow, mature. Growing up. You see, we're not out here in the ivory tower land. We're down here in, 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 in the blood and the guts and the gore of life. Why? Because this is where you live. You don't live out there. Good, it's got a purpose. It's got a design to it. All the things that work together for good to them that love God. Folks, if you love God, you know what? You're, it isn't, oh, I love you, God. I love you, Lord. You know what loving God is? Following the word of God rightly divided. That's loving God. The devils, remember that thing in Paul and Acts? And, the, and the, those devils, the demons look at that guy and they say, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you? <laughs> they worship God. They know who he is. It isn't about that. It's about, hey, what is, but God commended his love toward us. What is his love? That Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. He doesn't say that about Israel. He says that about you and I. And that's got the love of God isn't just loving God because he's a great whatever. Loving God is taking the word given to the Apostle Paul, given to you and I. And that's what eight, go back to Romans 8, 28 says. To them who are called according to his purpose. The called, the ones who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the ones who 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 are a, a member of the body of Christ who then come over here and they're called according to his purpose. What is God doing today? He's forming the church, the body of Christ, a separate heavenly entity, not Israel, not spiritual Israel, not an earthly entity. You won't step foot on the earth when you're in heaven. Now you can, but you're not going to want to. Why? It's Israel. It's her place. You and I are seated together in the heavenly places with him. I got one. That's good. You see, folks, you got to get over here where God's operating. And when you do, when the things of life come up, where he's operating, it produces good. There's a purpose. There's a design to it. 
It's not worthy to be compared with. It doesn't even get on the scale. Here's God's grace and, and all the glory and everything, and you try to stick some stuff on there, and it's like, get off. You don't even belong, and that just sticks. You don't, can't even get it on there. That's wonderful. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to start anything. You don't have to stop anything. You just, you just got to trust him. You can't even bring your own stuff. <laughs> Isn't that great? Because my stuff is a pile of, you know, what? Well, I wasn't going to say it, but Rodney did for me. So you, you just, it isn't about you. It's about what he's accomplished. And when you trust Christ and his, he, he, he places you into that church, into the body, and he's doing it according to his purpose. So the proper view and the circumstances of life, the situations that come up, is to take life and make it the arena, the coliseum, where we can take who we are in Christ and put his life on display in that arena, that coliseum of our life. That's the glory. By the way, if you look down at verse 20, uh, verse 30, moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, whom he justified, them he also glorified. You see that past tense? In God's eye, in God's mind, you are already seated in the heavenly places, glorified, even though in our reality we're stuck here in 2024. Come soon, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> How long are you going to wait, you know, to feel that cry? You see, you and I have to have that mindset. We have to have that thought process of, hey, look, what's happening in life right now doesn't compare. And when I think about glory, I'm already there. So then when I live my life, what can I do? I can live as if I'm already there. Come over to, to uh, where are we? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I find it very fascinating that all these verses here are in and around Paul working with the church at Corinth who had a lot of problems. And most of Christianity is either found in Corinthians or Galatians. <laughs> they're either self-centered or they're law-centered. And it's fascinating. So what does he do? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15 for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace, boy, what a way to say that, might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. There's Romans 8, 18 and following. What's going to happen? It's perishing. You understand that. Even you young people will understand that one day. Even though that, yet the inward man is what? Renewed. Now notice, day by day. Not once a week, not two times a week, what? Every day. So how do, now I think about that. How do you renew your mind day by day? That means in that arena of your life, what are you doing? You're taking God's word and applying it to all the details of life. Even when Alabama's losing and we're in the closing seconds. And I'm sitting there going, you ain't, you know, yelling at the TV. The wife and the dog have left. They've gone to the mall. Not there down the hall. See, even in that moment, I'm doing what? I'm, you know what? This is pretty stupid, Rick. <laughs> Just a ball game. But it's my team here, you know. And they win. Woo. And Linda comes down. Is it done yet? Around the corner. Go, yeah, it is. It's safe to come out. See, how do you renew your mind day by day? It's in all of that. You're cutting the grass. You're doing the dishes because the dishwasher's broke. You got all that going on. It's an everyday thing. Where am I going to go eat lunch? Well, Rick, he don't care about that. Yeah, but maybe there's something internally in your life that maybe you need to care about. Maybe you need to lose 20 pounds so you don't go to five guys. You go over to the salad and go place. Well, okay. 
<laughs> Let's go to five guys, okay? <laughs> See? Maybe, maybe that's what you have to do. It, it's inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, notice the, 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 the way to view the affliction. It's light, which is but for a moment. Now watch, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The light affliction for the moment. Now think about that. Compared to Christ at Calvary, what you and I go through in our worst day is light. It's going to, when we take God's word and we apply it correctly to the details of life, and we put his life on display, it's going to work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Wait a minute, the light affliction are things you see. They're right in front of you. We don't look at that. What are we looking at? But at the things which are not seen. We're, we got a heavenly viewpoint. We have a divine viewpoint. For the things which are, not seen, which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. What a great way to say what he's going to say down in 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. That's what 8, verse 418 is. When we walk by faith in the word of God, come back to Romans 8, because now we got to really quit. When we, when, we, <laughs> when we begin to love God, I think about that. When we begin to demonstrate how valuable we hold the Lord Jesus Christ. Then when we look at the details of our life, that's just a, 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 a pimple, a bump on the log. That's nothing. For what did he value? How did he value you? He died for you. So what does he say in 838? For I am persuaded... Well, that takes us back to verse 35, doesn't it? See, 838 is the next 8, but really we've got to go back to verse 35. What sh who shall separate us from the what? The love of who? The love of Christ. What, what happens in the middle of trouble? God doesn't love me. What do the religious guys say? God's not, he's not, oh, you don't got enough faith. And they, and they turn you up, put you on that treadmill. He said, no, who's going to separate you from the love of Christ? Paul asked a great question. Actually, there's a series of questions. Starts back up in verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? Why? Objections are going to be raised. What do you mean if you walk where you're supposed to be and do what God says you're to do today in the age of grace, that you've got all of this? What are you talking about? If God be for us, who can be against us? My goodness, how, have that mindset walking into fixing something and dealing with problems. Think about that. Folks, is God for you? Yeah, a little bit. Why? Verse 32, look at how much he's for you. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? How dare you let anyone come up and tell you you're not when God says, yes, you are. Man, the details of life come up, and you know all they say is you're a dumb, you're an idiot, you, you're a failure. Get the right word out. You, you're a loser, you know. No, not at all. God says, no, you're not. You're mine. I value you. How much do you value me? I, for who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That's the details of life. Tribulation and pain and, and distresses and persecution, famine, economics, and the onslaught of life, perils, the danger of life. Folks, we live in a dangerous world. Just watch the evening news. Think about that. The things of the sword, the government. Right now everything's okay, but one day the government might be against us. They were against Paul. That's why the church is in the house, they're underground. Why? The church at Rome can't own property, can't meet publicly. they got to meet secretly. That's coming our way maybe one day if the Lord tarries. We don't know. 
Oh, what was me? Oh. No, stand up. Let's go. Here we are. Verse 36, for it is written, for, they, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, what things? The things of verse 35, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. <laughs> I love that, persuaded. Belief beyond doubt. Man, just no, no question that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Who can, nothing can separate you. So you have to remember the eights, Romans 8 specifically. Think about that. Here you got, you got life just coming down on you with all fours. You just lost everything. You don't need a song by a country singer to help you get out of it. If I lost it all, but I had my, you know, you don't need all that. You need who you are in Christ. You need that identity. Verse 37 is the key to it all. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. You know what he's saying there? Life is not the enemy. The enemy is the adversary who would cause you, like we talked last week, to get you off of the simplicity that's in Christ. How does he do that? Attacks the Word of God, attacks you through that, and uses man, man, religious system, and gets you off. If he's got you off, he's won. He doesn't need to do any more. Folks, God put you in his Son, and in his Son is where he lives. And where he loves. And you're in there. So guess what? That's where we need to live, is in that. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we suffer, you've got to realize what's happening. It's a learning opportunity. And we need to have God's viewpoint on it. And Romans 8 gives us that viewpoint. Okay? Clear as mud? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray above all that we would stop and just rejoice in who we are in your Son. And thank you for that, not by lip service and not by stuff we say, but rather by our study and our life that we go live based on that study. And we do it all for your honor and for your glory. And as your ambassadors, that representation in this present evil world, we do that with all of our energy, all of our focus, and everything that we say and do. In your name we pray, amen.